Hello everyone, this is the second part of the talk I gave to the tourism cluster uh, last November. I divided it into two parts to make it easier both to record and for you to, to follow. Um, in part one, I hope you've seen it, I explained why it's time to change our minds. And now I'm going to introduce how we might go about doing so. In part one, I introduced the idea that we're living uh, at a transition point in history. Uh, nothing has happened on this scale and within such a short prime time frame ever. <laughs> um, so it's quite a, an interesting time to be alive on planet Earth. Uh, it seems that all our systems are breaking down at once. And to understand what's happening, we need to consider all of the systems, not just tourism, and the, the relationship between all of those systems. Now, up until recently, science has focused more or less exclusively on parts and what separates one from another. And in tourism, we spend a lot of time trying to define sustainability, define regeneration, compare the two, what's good about one and what's bad about another, etc. That is less important than understanding the relationships between these different phenomena uh, and any phenomenon, in fact. Um, because in nature, it's the relationships connecting the parts is what really matters. So whether we know it or like it or not, we're all involved in whole scale systems change right now. And each of us has a role to play. We're all part of the transition and we're witnessing the dying of an old dominant system and the birth of a new. So let me take you through this map um, to explain what's really happening. At the beginning uh, of a transition, when one dominant system is, is dying and another one is emerging, being born in effect, there tend to be two seemingly opposed groups. Um, within the dominant system, we have pioneers, eccentrics, uh, innovators, who ask difficult questions and are seen as disrupting the old. Uh, the old but is established and weakening system. And they're often opposed or ridiculed by the resistors of the old, in the old system who try to both slow things down and also positively hold things together. Um, so they provide uh, a stabilizing role. Um, they keep the lights running, for example, so that we don't go into chaos too quickly. Now, at first, these individual pioneers, uh, shown on the diagram here, um, are more or less invisible. They're under the radar, as it were. Many think they're alone, that they're the only people making the change. Um, they tend to think their approach, their system, their methodology is going to be the one that uh, is going to help us through. Um, and this uh, only slowly do they start to connect up, um, share ideas, uh, create something together, begin talking about movements and form communities of practice, etc. And the more they link, the more here the linking is taking place, the networks are building, the more emergent system becomes visible and stronger and stronger and stronger. And eventually it becomes the dominant system. In the meantime, the old system is weakening, it's breaking down, it needs care. And that's why on this diagram, there is this reference here to hospice work, um, making sure, as I say, that we make this transition as painlessly as possible. So each of us has a role to play, pioneer, stabilizer, hospice worker, you name it. So you might want to ask now, what do we need to do? What can I do to help this transition? The first step is to recognize that what we all tend to see as problems are actually only symptoms of a much deeper set of problems or issues. Um, the truth is um, we've become a society of of problem fixes. 
Um, we're trained to identify a problem, define it and its parts, um, figure out what the causes are, um, and then attempt to fix each part on a separate one-by-one -one basis. Um, for example, as shown in the um, slide, if we have a headache, we take an aspirin. Um, but it, we haven't yet necessarily determined what is the cause of that headache. Um, so the solution rarely lasts. It, it, treats, uh, it treats a symptom. So climate change and biodiversity loss are similar in that they're both symptoms of a much deeper cause. And yet, while we like to analyze them and, uh, I'd, and uh, come up with solutions for each separately, you know, for example, we have COP for climate and we have a COP for biodiversity, they are all utterly interconnected and we can't really look at one without bearing in mind the impact on the other. So our tendency to categorize and separate means we often focus on specific solutions, like for example, uh, uh, organic fuels for uh, aviation. Um, but we're often unaware of how one solution has the potential to create other problems or aggravate other symptoms. Um, so again, let's look at climate change. A symptom is rising temperature, increasing weather hazards. The problem has been identified as too many CO2 emissions associated with the burning of fossil fuels. So the solution then is the reduction in emissions and a switch from fossil fuels to renewables. Now, even if we could do that, um, and it's, it's highly unlikely that we're going to be able to make that switch between now and 2030, it wouldn't be enough to create that safe operating space for humanity because climate change is just part of a much bigger set of symptoms of a system that's gone wrong. The root cause is in fact a socio-economic system of production and consumption that is dependent on year-on-year -year growth and that is outpacing nature's capacity to keep up with the toxins that are, that are produced, the emissions that are produced, uh, the need to restore the forests that are degraded, etc., etc. And that system is based on our way of thinking. Our, uh, it was Einstein who actually figured it out a long time ago when he said that um, the world we've created is a product of that thinking. It can't be changed until we change our thinking. Uh, so I'm not saying anything original here. Um, there is one word that describes that bundle of thoughts, values, uh, assumptions and beliefs um, that underpin our systems, and that's called a paradigm or worldview. Up until recently, people like us, growing up in the westernized um, global north, have assumed that our paradigm is the only one. We've only just begun to question it, by the way. And we've colonized much of the planet with that paradigm. But there are, in fact, many other paradigms and perspectives operational around the world, and we're only just beginning to acknowledge and recognize them. So, in short, we may live in one universe, but when it comes to paradigms and ways of understanding how the world works, it actually resembles a pluriverse. Socially and culturally, our systems form a mosaic, with each contributing to the total. Another wise man who lived in the 1940s, Gregory Bateson, uh, summarized this root cause in this way. The major problems in the world are the result of the difference between how nature works and the way people think. Now, that's a great explanation. Uh, it's far easier to say than it is to practice, because to practice it means that we do need to fully understand how nature works, what principles uh, have enabled us to evolve from tiny cells in a, in a, in a swamp land <laughs> um, into the, the complexity of our societies today. Um, but nevertheless, it, it does summarize what we've got to start to do. Well, there are many ways in which our thinking does in fact differ from the way the world really works or the way that nature operates. Um, this one slide um, highlights the um, key 
elements, the, the most fundamental element, and that is that the dominant Western worldview sees planet Earth, life, our bodies and brains as complicated machines that are made up of diverse but very separate parts, and that in order to understand how a machine works, then we should be able to identify the parts, extract the ones that are broken and faulty, and replace them with working parts. But as you and I are not machines, we're alive, we're actually a set of complex systems nested within many other systems. The other difference between a living system and a machine is that a machine requires a creator or inventor or an engineer who can stop or start it and keep it fueled and running. Without an external form of energy, the machine runs down and stops. Life, on the other hand, is constantly self-regenerating, replicating and adapting to the conditions of the system of which it is a part. I guarantee you already know what I'm talking about because you understand how our bodies work. Some 30 trillion cells organize in themselves into tissues that organize into organs that collaborate to form systems. So, for example, we have tissues that form um, a metabolic, uh, an organ, the stomach, the intestines, and that becomes our metabolic system, and so on and so on. So let's move away from our bodies to what we know about our dominant social and economic systems and figure out where we sit in the great transition I talked about earlier. Um, this uh, diagram shows that we are moving, in a sense, from a extractive economy based on this machine or mechanical understanding of the world that began in the 1600s initially um, but really uh, took off with the arrival of the steam engine in the mid-1700s in Europe. By the 1960s, it had grown into what is now a global industrial machine of production and consumption, which most people assume is the natural way of doing things. Um, over time, again, the negative effects of phenomena such as soil erosion, pollution, etc., became more and more evident. Um, the de degradation of soil in California uh, in the 1930s led to the Great Depression. Um, so the impacts were not minimal. Um, slowly, the signs of, of poisons and toxins polluting uh, the land and water couldn't be ignored. Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring in 1962. And it became clear that if we were to continue to grow the economy, in other words, produce and consume more each year, we would have to try and do less harm. So that's why we have on the left side an extractive economy that is trying to be sustainable. Um, even though the economy hasn't changed, it's based on resource extraction and the use of public goods such as fresh air, water and open spaces, and until very recently, companies were not required to pay for these so-called commons or free services. Um, they could externalize or shift off their balance sheet the costs, the social costs, the environmental costs of, of their actions, and those were just literally labeled externalities. In other words, they didn't need to be counted. We've moved a long way since then, of course. So over this 50-year period, we've been trying harder and harder to do less harm, so much so that we now even dream of an economy that will do no harm. Um, and we use accounting terms like net zero to express that dream. So the focus has been very much on reducing our impact, shrinking our footprint, being sustainable. But despite all that, each year, our situation, the impacts of our activities, have worsened and worsened and worsened. More recently, um, and thanks largely to the leadership of Paul Pullman, the former chair of Unilever, um, there's been thought that perhaps doing less harm isn't motivating enough. We've been encouraged to aim beyond that and do no harm and repair the damage done in the past. In other words, as you've heard often these days, to give back more than we take. 
Now, this, if you want again to use those accounting terms, will bring us to the point of becoming net positive. Um, so, in a sense, where we're at at the moment is we've moved to the big question mark at the end of the line, um, from sustainability to net zero to net positive. Um, and yet we still know that that's not enough, it's not working. So to illustrate our real serious, <laughs> the seriousness of our situation, I think that this um, image probably expresses it better than any other. Here we have humanity in the form of four climbers, um, diligently going up, up a path. It leads upwards, uh, ideally towards greater progress. Um, what they are unaware of, of course, is if they continue on that particular route, they will come not so much to a dead end, but to an abyss and catastrophe. Um, and the real need is to get down off that mountain, uh, into the valley, across the valley and over to the other side and to find a way of doing that. So to complete a map of the transition as a journey, um, I believe that what is needed to get off that particular path and avoid the precipice is a, a paradigm shift. In other words, a change in the values, beliefs, assumptions that we've been carrying with us to support the economy as it exists today. Um, it will involve remembering that we are nature. We're not um, separate from it. We can't continue to extract or destroy it, but we must learn how nature works and create the conditions for life to thrive. Only this fundamental shift in thinking and being and doing will enable us to become regenerative as opposed to extractive. Um, it means redefining success. Uh, it means replenishing what we've created. So yes, not only repairing, but ensuring that which we have repaired or uh, is capable of regenerating itself in perpetuity and evolving in a natural way. Um, so this is so much more than what I see happening right now, where the word regeneration is being attached to a lot of activities that make perfect sense, community engagement, nature-based solutions and so on. Um, but that in itself is not enough. It's kind of seductive and deceitful because it avoids addressing this need to fundamentally change the purpose and nature of the system. It avoids the responsibility of developing the skills and knowledge and wisdom necessary to partner with nature to ensure that we're building that capacity to self-generate in perpetuity. So that's, um, that is to me the, the, the nature of the transition as, as a current journey. Now in this uh, next section, we're going to look at uh, just four steps that we can take to begin to understand what a regenerative alternative to our current materialistic mechanical paradigm might look like and what it would imply. Um, and that will mean taking a long, hard look at the way we see and develop our relationships. If you remember, um, regenerative thinking places far more importance on relationships, connections, the flow between them. So our relationship with nature, if you recall, Gregory Bateson said this is the first place to start. Do we understand how nature works? What is our, our relationship with the rest of the natural world? Um, our relationships with each other. What assumptions do we have about human nature, how we behave as humans? Um, and finally, our relationship with ourselves. How well do we know ourselves? Uh, how well do we care for ourselves? Because if we don't care for ourselves, we cannot care for others and the rest of life. The other thing is that regenerative thinking requires that we use all four ways of knowing not just our mental faculties to think, but our bodies to sense and experience. This is very important when we're out in nature. Um, a tree is not going to tell us anything about ourselves that we can understand in language, but we can learn to listen to what the tree is experiencing. 
Um, our hearts uh, are really important because we need to feel and empathize with each other and with other life forms. And our intuition will help us uh, develop our inner wisdom, if you like, to see more deeply, to see things that otherwise we may never have recognized. Now, the picture of the young man, Damon Gamow, is there for a reason. It's a link where I'm suggesting that you um, take take the time to go and look at his 15-minute uh, TED Talk in Sydney. He's a young man, uh, parent of, of, of children, concerned about their future, an actor, a writer, and then became a, a very competent filmmaker. He's made films about regeneration as well. Um, but here he's, he's basically in 15 minutes explaining how our way of seeing the world has changed since the Middle Ages uh, and the people that influenced that change and what it all means. And I really recommend you have it, uh, watch it, and perhaps feel inclined to discuss it with your friends and family. The, so the second thing you can do really is to take a little time to catch up with the fundamental changes in contemporary science. Uh, many of these are still, in fact, most of these are still to have reached the classroom. Um, and I've just identified again four thinkers. You don't need to read the source, but you can read about them. Um, David Bohm, I've mentioned before, he was a, a very eminent uh, quantum physicist, a star pupil of Einstein, who contributed to our understanding that we do not live in a material universe, but an energetic universe. Everything ultimately that we experience is energy in at a, operating at one level of vibration or another. And he was able to prove that everything in, in nature, in the universe, is always uh, continuously connected to absolutely everything else. Uh, it's called the science of entanglement. Um, so the, there's a huge impact uh, of, of that finding that is worth just taking in. The second um, gentleman to the right of um, Bohm on the screen is another great influencer called Fritrof Capra, um, a science writer initially, but he has become a major <laughs> contributor to thinking um, about science and his focus for many years now has been on the nature of the living systems that make up the universe and how those living systems work and how we can, in a sense, uh, start to move in syn synchrony with them, in harmony with them. He's a beautiful writer and I well recommend you um, look him up and see if some of his work is accessible to you. The uh, lovely lady in the middle of the screen is a, is a British Columbian, and as you know, that's where I spent 20 years of my professional life. Um, she was the first female forester, um, and she was grew up in a, in a forest. Her parents were of the old style of, you know, foresters with, you know, one horse and <laughs> cut down one tree at a time. Um, but she went to study how forests thrive, how they work, and discovered that underneath the surface of, of a forest floor is this incredibly rich network of communication. She called it the wood wide web, and that provides the means whereby uh, trees can photosynthesize, the sun shines on their leaves, and then essentially send down those new, those new that energy. And at the same time, under the surface, the fungi and the various micro uh, animals, that mine, small animals and, and life forms, literally <laughs> billions of them, um, are busy sharing, communicating, um, and uh, as, I, as I say, working as a very complex system to maintain soil fertility, to enable the trees to flourish. And she discovered that trees do share, they communicate with each other. And uh, her work is just mind-blowing. And she's had a huge impact on current systems thinking. And the gentleman on the right, one of the most uh, profoundly educated um, and deep thinkers probably on the planet today, 
uh, was both a medical doctor and then became a neuroscientist who looked at both sides of our brain um, and discovered that, you know, one side of that brain is fully capable of appreciating the whole in its surroundings, of, of basically seeing an awful lot and understanding connections almost intuitively, um, whereas the left side of the brain is very much more, uh, we would say, pragmatic, practical, um, likes fixed ideas and definitions and fixed relationships and breaks everything down into parts. And what he's saying is that with overuse of that side of the brain, it's tended to cut, shut out the right side of the brain, where, which fuels, if you like, the work of poets and mystics and artists and musicians. Um, and we need to get back to a balance between, between the two. Um, all different, obviously, but again, an indication of just how, how different our understanding of the world has become. So, uh, you know, while the Western modern way of thinking um, has under, uh, that underpins our economic system, that's spread globally in the last 40, 50 years. And we tend to think it's the only way of thinking. We forget that we, we in the global north, we in the, from a European background and North American background, um, we don't, we don't, we're not even the majority in terms of people. And a way of thinking is just one of many. And fortunately, there's a growing awareness that um, many of the indigenous cultures, which go back thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, are shrinking in number. They're under threat from modernization. And yet they have this rich knowledge, much of it passed down orally. But fortunately, there are a growing number of young indigenous people that have also been educated in the Western way, not because it's better, but because their understanding of the Western way and their ability to communicate um, their way of seeing the world into our language has really helped our understanding. Um, and the fact that they are so much closer, closer in the operating principles, if you like, they're closer to the natural world than, than we are. Um, we know, for example, that they have management control over 5% of the land surface, but in that 5%, some 80% of all life's biodiversity currently exists. So that suggests they know something that we, we don't know or are ignoring. So these are just images of, of writers um, if we continue this conversation, obviously, I can take you into more depth. But the great thing about the Arctic Circle is that you're living in um, a region where the Sami um, live alongside us, uh, or you, because I obviously don't live in the Arctic, but um, these indigenous communities also have a wealth of knowledge, cultural and ecological about the places that you occupy and just a fantastic source of um, wisdom and understanding. And finally, it's really encouraging to see that some of the really major global policy institutions, this is one of them, the International Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystems, they're recognizing now that there's more than one way to look at nature. The modern science looks at it in one way, but the indigenous communities around the world look at it very differently. And in their latest report, they went uh, to great lengths to explain in plain language how these various worldviews uh, differ. So to the Western mindset, a person living near a river sees it as a, a, a resource. They live from that river. Uh, it's a, a resource to be extracted. Um, some also enjoy living in and identify with the riverine landscape. Um, in your case, it would be probably the forest and the river landscape. And uh, as their understanding of the natural world deepens, they begin to appreciate all the diverse species that share with which they share the river. And so then they talk about living with the river. Um, an indigenous person, however, does not make a distinction between themselves and the river. They see themselves as nature, not just uh, 
uh, separate from it as um, and the river as part of them and that is uh, affects uh, fundamentally affects um, what they value and how they they uh, take care of the place because it's an extension of of who they are now we come to the second step forward that's proving a challenge for many who are still thinking with the old linear material story of the planet as a machine or just as a resource. In nature, however, a healthy living system lives in harmony or balance with the larger system of which it is a part. As ecologists now know, each ecosystem can only support a certain amount of growth in, from one of its species um, and has developed many natural mechanisms for modulating the growth of subpopulations, such that each either directly or indirectly supports the health of another. A cancer cell, for example, is a, is a rogue cell that needs to be, if you like, controlled and, and uh, perhaps eliminated because of the harm it's doing to a physical body. In some respects, I hate to say this, but we humans are acting very much like um, a, a cancer cell because both cancer cells and humans have lost that ability to turn off the growth switch. Now, the earliest and most thorough analysis quantifying just how much growth of the production consumption system that planet Earth could conceivably support with its own natural abilities was a report called Limits to Growth. Actually, it was published the very year I got my undergraduate degree. So as you can imagine, it had quite an impact on me. Now, while its forecasts in 1972 of what we would be experiencing around about now, while they were surprisingly accurate, the report was rejected by most powerful institutions. And only recently has the taboo on discussing uh, limits to growth been lifted. Now, since then, another important source of uh, discussion on this topic that I would recommend is Tim Jackson's book, uh, Prosperity Without Growth, where he looks at the potential to redefine growth in different ways. And again, it's, it's exciting to see the changes taking place. So perhaps growth is about flourishing, uh, thriving, in other words, about well-being. And a number of countries are, in fact, considering replacing gross domestic product, GDP, which is a mere measure of economic activity, regardless of its impact. They're looking at replacing GDP with wellness as a national objective. In the global north, the younger generation is actively considering the notion of degrowth. Now, this is less scary than it sounds. Um, it's more about those economies that are well-established, uh, slowing down parts of their economy, uh, that are harmful and focusing more and more on quality and less on quantity of growth. They also recognize that much of the wealth in the northern global north, particularly in countries like Scandinavia, UK and so on, is, has been based on exploiting the resources of the global south, where the negative impacts of climate change are now being most sorely felt and where the ability to cope with those impacts is, is, is far less than ours. So it's a strategy for the wealthy global north whose consumption of material production can and needs to slow in order to enable less developed countries in the south to catch up. So I've put in some other links here. There was a major conference in the European Parliament on beyond growth and the idea that, as I mentioned in earlier slides, that we can have green growth um, has pretty well been debunked. So let's look, go back to Gregory Bateson's injunction, and that is to learn to think the way that nature thinks. Now, nature's goal is clear. It's to create the conditions for all life to thrive and evolve, because life is constantly regenerating itself. Regeneration is not a new buzzword or a trend. It's actually what life does naturally, every second, every minute, of every day. Now, our task as humans is to get back into harmony with that purpose and become regenerative every second of every day. 
So when we're contributing to life's regeneration, we're acting in harmony with the nature, with life, with living and aliveness. And isn't it that sense of being fully alive that most of us seek and value? I'm sure if I asked any of you, do you wish your children to be sustainable? Uh, you probably f frow your, you know, frown and think about it and say, well, not really. I, I just want them to be happy, to be well, to flourish in the future. So if sustainability is doing less harm, then regeneration is about developing the innate capability of a system to self-organize, to thrive, and to evolve by applying the same principles that nature has used to generate and evolve life. Using, let's use a, an oak tree as an example. There's no oak tree, um, and I, I don't suppose you have many oak trees in the Arctic, but you have birch trees. There's no oak tree or birch tree that grows in size every year forever. They do at some point stop. There's a built-in off switch which halts the expansion process and shifts the growth process from towards maturation, towards more complexity. And in the case of many species, enabling that, that particular tree to become home to many other species, thereby creating the conditions for life to thrive within the tree. A mature oak tree, for example, is a haven for a colossal 2,300 wildlife species, some too small for you to see, but 2,300 wildlife species and provides them with the vital space to eat, shelter and breed. So in summary, if we're to live in harmony with the natural world, we had to shift from extraction to contribution, from more quality away from quantity, from growth to flourishing, to more diversity and to more balance. The third step is um, an interesting one, and that is to break away from the habit of just aiming for scale. It's this sort of drive we have to be to be bigger than anything, anyone else, or create a, a solution that goes global. In fact, our financial institutions are completely habituated to looking for investments which will scale up, when in actual fact what we're looking for are investments that can scale across in the sense that the, the, the solution may be generic, but the way that it's practiced um, is going to be unique to each individual place. So think of scaling uh, across and not scaling up. Um, now regeneration, uh, like nature, um, involves a, a relatively small number of core principles that operate throughout nature um, and that can be applied locally and manifest themselves locally according to the unique conditions of the place. Because each place on the planet is in fact unique. The sun falls differently on every square inch of the Earth's surface. And each place has a unique geology, soil, hydrology and microclimate. Now we can't deal with places as small as a few square inches or square meters because even those places depend on what's around them in the larger ecosystem. But we can identify what are called bioregions, which are um, uh, ecological regions that, that exist with their own unique ecology and that has supported a unique, coherent culture um, on top of it. So the map on the bottom right hand corner of this, um, of this graph um, is a map of 185 distinct bioregions that exist across the globe, each, as I say, with their own unique ecology and culture. And there's a growing recognition that it's at that scale we might be starting to think about regeneration. But in many, in many instances, the regenerative impulse may start even more locally 
than than that in smaller communities. So tourism destinations are actually very abstract concepts, often created by marketing campaign campaigns and having to correlate with political jurisdictions, uh, sources of funding, whose boundaries rarely respect nature's boundaries and hardly ever do they involve um, real walls. They're, as I say, they're abstract. But to do regeneration, we need to feel rooted in a place. We need to have a, an, a sense of relationship with that place. And that place needs to have ecological and cultural coherence. So Bill Reed, who is a mentor of mine and has written some of the best papers on regeneration as applied to the built environment and planning, says that um, we can best see the impact and respond in our places, in where we feel we belong and where our love of the place unleashes the personal and political will needed to make profound change. So it's often the love of a place that converts a collection of strangers into a living community. And if you go right back to the very beginning of this long lecture, as well as Harman alluded, change actually uh, that involves seeing, being and doing things differently often starts at the smallest unit, the, the individual. So it's going to start with you, but then it's going to start with you acting in a place that you really care about. Ideas and concepts might well trickle down or across, you know, this is this is a generic idea, regeneration, and you're receiving this idea and dealing with it as you wish, but the actions that you take will push up and ripple out. So uh, never doubt that um, a small group of people, as Margaret Mead said, can change the world because that's the way it's always happened. But um, I just want to go back to this notion of place and bioregions um, because we're working right now in the Arctic and within the Arctic that is one large bioregion but we're working across three national boundaries and there are subtle but important differences between each of the countries and, and how you see things um, and the mix of businesses and industries as well as tourism also changes. Um, but let me quote from one of my mentors, Dan Daniel Wall, when he defines or describes bioregeneration. That's regeneration in bioregions. He says it's about refitting human cultures to the unique biocultural conditions of place. And this can be achieved through nurturing the place sourced capacity to express that uniqueness by engaging a growing number of people in an open and inclusive process of co-creating responses to the needs of the people in their local region in ways that generate much healthier systems, okay? Um, but you cannot do that um, on your own. This approach means that all sectors of society and commerce in a bioregion need to work together. We need all uh, the diversity represented, older people, younger people, professionals, people who work with their hands. We need the different industries represented. So in Karuna, for example, you cannot talk about the vitality of Karuna without engaging the mining community. And the mining community cannot talk about the vitality without engaging the tourism community. And we'll also need to involve healthcare people, teachers, educators, and so on. So we're not talking tourism strategies when we're talking regeneration. We're talking the community resilience and thrivability. Your goal is to build the capacity for a community to envision, to plan for and shape its future. So in this process, tourism can be a contributor, but not the lead player. We have to break out of our tourism silos if we want to play in the regenerative space. So the, uh, the question every, every participant must ask is how can our activities best contribute to the shared health and well-being of this place? And this leads to my uh, last point in this presentation uh, that I'd like you to really give some serious thought to, and that is the tourism and hospitality sector are actually best positioned 
to play a contributing role um, to those uh, localized place-oriented discussions of thriving and regeneration, simply because of the very essence of what we do. Um, I would argue that we are, by nature, already in the revitalization business. Um, we receive guests into our hotels who are often tired and need a rest, need a break, and our job is to, to make them feel comfortable and in fact, to revitalize them with, with uh, comfortable accommodations, beautiful, nutritious food, um, a sense of welcome and warmth that revitalizes and brings them back to health. In other words, back to life, back in touch with themselves and what matters. So we're in the recreation business, and that means we recreate um, health and well-being and also, if we have a chance to share the uniqueness of our nation, of our region, I should say, and well, our nation in many respects, we can help them experience the, the wonder and beauty of the natural world all around them. So that's uh, one of the contributions that we can make. The second one comes from, again, the, the very essence of what we do. We connect strangers, hosts and guests, guests and guests, guests and staff. And that's part of this um, uh, flow uh, essence or the nature of flow. All natural systems require that they are connected and there is the much freedom in the flow of nutrients, uh, ideas, intelligence, energy between one system and another. So in some respects, that's exactly what, what our, our sector is all about. It's about connecting. Um, helping that flow to take place. We convene and host meetings. The other uniqueness of it is that we are the rooted ones. Um, if you run a small hotel or a B&B &B or a restaurant, you are tied to that place. You can reflect that place in the way you offer services and so on. We're also the inhabitants, the taxpayers of that place, and we're the closest to the community. So hopefully, uh, in this longer version of the presentation, um, I've given you uh, food for thought. And what I would like to suggest um, is that you read, if you're interested, you uh, obviously listen to the presentation. Um, I'm going to prepare a set of questions for you to consider. What I would love to have happen is that you meet together in groups in each country, perhaps, to start. And those that are uh, interested, um, perhaps we can have another online um, webinar where we actually look at those questions together. And on that basis, decide the kind of less learning that you would like to undertake going future. What we do need right now are people that have spent the time trying to understand these complex topics. And so I make no apology for the length of this presentation. I'm just hopeful that with my technical abilities, I can pull it all together in one. Um, but I thank you for your attention. And I believe that there is plenty of courage and attitude, the kind of courage that Wangari Matai talks about in this concluding slide in your region, and that you can become leaders um, and contribute to the efforts that are already happening at the NORIG level. So if you want any more information, please don't hesitate to write to me and uh, let's see if we can take this one step further. Thank you.